It is almost my anniversary in terms of being here with this congregation. It's almost been six years. One of the things I really enjoyed when I first started coming to United is the stories that you all told. There were stories of people that are no longer here that were a part of the faith journey. I got to learn a lot about you all from invitations into homes and the stories that you told. Stories are a part of our journey. They're a part of our walk together. And so today we have invited a few people to share their stories. Today we are doing stories and songs because stories are powerful. And so we have a few people that have been with us for a short time and some that have been with us a long time. And so we look forward to hearing those stories today. So appropriate in the hymn today, I love to tell the story. I'm inviting you not to tell the story maybe, but to hear the story of four folks that journey with us. The first person today is Minister Valerie Tatum, and her story is entitled Facing Fears. Minister Valerie, please come forward. Praise the Lord, saints. The title of my story is Facing Fears. Now the process of facing fears is called exposure. Exposure involves gradually and repeatedly going into fear situations until you feel less anxious. Now, I was reading this book by Howard Thurman, who is the author of Jesus and the Disinherited, and I know that in chapter two, he writes about fear as being one of the persistent hounds of hell. That is a constant attack on the poor and hurting. He elaborates on fear being an old as life of man on the planet. He also continues to discuss fear and how it shows up in our health, in our thoughts, and in our actions. Well, when I was 12 years old, I experienced fear or the exposure. It was terrifying and it was a situation that I would never want to go through again. I considered it a life-changing event. My mother was only 42 years old at the time. It was a cold and blistering and snowy day. Ice wouldn't melt right away and in Chicago we have what you call black ice. Apparent to the eyes very little, but you'll know it when you come across it. The sidewalks were covered. Anyone in Chicago knows the dangers of black ice, the dangers to walkers and cars driving along the road. My mother wanted to go to work, as she had always done, didn't think the ice would stop her on this day because most Chicagoans know how to manage this kind of weather. My mother was preparing for the journey going to work, getting all of her children ready for school. My grandmother was present because she would be the one to watch and make sure we leave out, go to school, and that, you know, she would be there if the school needed to call home. So as she prepared for this journey, we're getting ready for school. It was a great day. No worries. I began to talk to my father as he left out. He was going to work too. So we were just there eating, putting on coats, getting ready for school, my mother leaving. She put on her winter coat and my mother, oh, she always looking so beautiful. She's gorgeous even now. She put on her winter clothing. I hugged and kissed her and I told her to have a good day. I watched through the eyes of a child as she opened the doors Stepped outside, I heard the crunch of the salt that my father had already put down earlier that morning. See, he would get up at like about three and he would just start shoveling, putting ice, you know, the snow, just, just taking care of everything. And I was just like, that's, you know, 12 years old. I don't know why I found that exciting, but it was a great thing. Then I heard the light scream. I rushed to the door, and there she lay with her head on the step. I said, don't move, Mom. 
I was dazed, shaken, and scared. My heart started beating fast. I yelled to someone to call 911. I didn't know what else to do. I ran next door because I felt no one was coming fast enough. And in Chicago, we know ambulance move pretty fast, but at this time, they weren't moving fast enough for me because I was afraid. I was in fear. I was scared. My neighbor came and helped me get my mother to the hospital. Doctors checked on her right away, began working on her. I sat with my feet dangling in the emergency room, 12 years old, and all I can do was sit and dangle. The smell, the drama, and loud noises took me to a place so different from the sounds of my normal life. I tried desperately to close out the noise, but the shouts of cold blue, cold blue, cold blue came to the mix. I became greatly afraid and anxious. I was ready to jump out of my chair. I felt a panic arise in me, tears streaming down my face. Was my mother okay? Was she dead? I could only hear and feel fear. Fear that had, I lost my mother. Is she going home today? She didn't fall that hard, I didn't think. The doctor came my way. The feeling began to increase. He said my name, Valerie. Your mother's very sick. The trauma to her head has revealed a condition to her heart. It's called tachycardia, when the heart beats too fast. He said, we will need to do more tests and provide medication. I'm 12 years old. I'm sitting there looking. Why are you talking to me? I'm only 12. What am I going to do? Can you see the fear? I'm shaking. I'm dangling. He said, we will need to talk to your father as well. So the family understands what my mother would need. When my father came and received the support we needed from the doctors, they said this will be a life battle for your mother. Hmm, a life battle. Am I going to be afraid the rest of my life? Am I going to be able to see my mom as the same? I went home once my mother was settled into the hospital and asked God through prayer to help my family. Take good care of my mother. Today, my mother is 86 years old, strong, and the grandmother of four generations, 65 children. Ranges and ages from seven months old to 48 years old. Did I have fear in my life? Yes. Did God step in my entire life to show me how to overcome fear? Yes. Did I do it alone? No. Did God provide resources and people to help me? Yes. Is fear real? Yes. Can we overcome fear? Yes. The lives we live will provide opportunity for fear to come in. Will you trust God to help you with your fear? Amen. Uh, please join me in supporting that story with hymn number 129. Give to the winds thy fears, you don't have to stand for that. Verse 1 and 2.
Well, I'm the second storyteller, and my story I've entitled The Singing Methodist after a title that my father used in some writing that he did for the New United Methodist Church back in 1968. I grew up in a Methodist parsonage, as I think most of you know, and uh, my mother's pride and joy was her a baby grand piano, which was given to her by very sacrificial gifts from her husband, my dad, and her relatives. She was a great piano player, almost as good as Joe here. Uh, she, could, she, could, she could sight read, and it was fantastic. We'd put the hymnal in front of her. She could open it to almost any page and play right then and there no matter if it had five flats and five sharps, she could, she'd work that hymn and, and play it. And later on, she played for, uh, for a number of uh, church functions. But I grew up as a child in a family that sang hymns. We used the hymnal of the Methodist Church at that time as a devotional guide for family devotions and it was not unusual for all five of the Dietrichs to gather around the piano. Mother would play and sing alto. My sister, older sister Barbara, sang soprano. My dad sang bass. And my brother Phil and I, whose voices were changing, did our best to handle the tenor part. But we would sing in harmony various hymns. Some of the hymns we most loved were those that were written by Charles Wesley. And you know, you know those hymns. If I call off the names, you're going to register the music in your mind. Listen to some of the hymns that you know written by Charles Wesley. Love divine, all loves excelling. Or the Christmas hymn, Hark the herald angels sing. Or one of the great Easter hymns, Christ the Lord is risen today. Or Jesus, lover of my soul. Or rejoice, the Lord is king. Those are just a few of the 6,500 hymns that Charles Wesley or the John, yeah, Charles Wesley wrote for the Methodist congregations, these little gatherings of Methodist people all across England that the Wesleys helped to start. Well, uh, these were the hymns that we sang as a family and many more as well. At the time that the Methodist movement started, the Catholic Church conducted the Mass in such a way that Catholic worshipers, faithful Catholic worshipers, were instructed to come to church to watch, to watch the Mass as the priests performed it from the front of the, of the church. And so Catholics became watching Christians. In the Anglican Church, the big Anglican churches had marvelous choirs, and Anglicans were invited to come to church to listen. So you came to church as a spectator. But in the Methodist societies, you were invited to sing. Join the singing Methodists. And Charles Wesley wrote those hymns, so many, and others did too, for the Methodists to sing. My father wrote about it this way. He wrote 200 years ago when neighbors from surrounding farms and towns met in a home or school house or barn to hear the itinerant preacher, they would sing. These Methodists had a rich heritage of hymns and songs given by the Wesley brothers, John and Charles, as well as others, mostly unaccompanied because pianos were scarce. They sang their faith. 
being a Methodist really meant one engaged in singing in those days. If I may depart for a moment, I was working in the Diocese of Oakland, California, and was with the Roman Catholic Church, and Bishop John Cummins invited me to a worship service and said to me, don't expect the Catholic people to sing like you Methodists. So we're just learning how to sing in our worship services. So maybe you can do your best to encourage others around you to sing. Interesting, I thought. Well, anyway, as my father continues, today's United Methodists, under far different conditions, can share in this custom from former generations. Let John Wesley encourage us to sing as he did those in his 18th century and see the hymnal not only as something to be used in church, but to be used at home devotionally. Turn to page seven, please, in the hymnal, in Roman numeral seven, in the very front of your hymnal. And you'll find there directions for singing that John Wesley, uh, John Wesley wrote to, uh, to help the Methodists learn to sing proper, what he considered properly in church. His rules can help us. There's humor in, on, in these rules. Uh, number four, about lusty singing, and number five, about modesty in singing. Well, happy are those who do, my dad continued. Wesley's point is very important. We're singing not for our enjoyment mainly, but rather to please and to praise God. So we participate in our worship in this church because we are Methodist and Presbyterian and United Church, formerly Congregationalist, all of whom have a great tradition in singing. You come to church not just to see and not just to hear, but to participate. You sing your faith. Let's turn to what is always the first hymn in a Methodist hymnal. In this case, number 57, and sing one verse of this hymn written by Charles Wesley. Jade, I'm your third talker speaker today, and um, he mentioned about singing, which is wonderful. Uh, you will hear Lusty singing in this presentation, <laughs> fair warning. I just wanted to talk about my journey toward God. Um, I did not uh, have a, religion was not in my house as a young person, and I did not have a direct relationship with God until around 30, age 30. Um, but God was always speaking to me through music, and healing me through music. Um, I ran away from home when I was 15, and I went through a bunch of terrible things, and I had a lot of unexpressed pain and anger. And I was, at the time, traumatized by it, so I couldn't even notice it myself. And I wrote a lot of songs when I tried to return home, and they were the opposite of what I was um, subconsciously feeling. So they were just full of joy and happiness and beauty. And as time went on, um, I started to feel the pain and anger that I had. And I had friends that I tried to talk to about it. And uh, it, it, what had made me so uncomfortable, I couldn't feel it, made them terribly uncomfortable. <laughs> so 
um, they would always come back with, you know, there's somebody who's always worse off than you or something. So every time I tried to express what was like bubbling up inside of me and kind of eating me alive, um, I was encouraged not to. And um, so I stuffed it back in <laughs> and I was a very proud young woman and I really rep represented myself well. I looked like I was highly educated even though I hadn't finished high school. And I was very well spoken and very positive all the time. <laughs> and and um, it was difficult, um, it wasn't a farce, it was just like a shield. Uh, for years I did that. And then um, the songs are where I started healing. It's like, well, I, these people won't let me talk to them. Um, church wasn't part of my life, but even the few times I went to church with someone else, you know, it's like, feel the joy of the Lord. <laughs> Just like, oh. <laughs> so I was really hurting. And, um, so the songs just started to come out. So I thought I'd just share a few uh, verses with you. Um, and that was really beyond my control. I was uh, always to, um, my songwriting has just been, get it on paper before it disappears. So the first one that came out expressing pain was called Blues Rhymes. I don't know why I feel like I'm gonna cry. I feel so sad. I got the blues like I never had. Don't want your sympathy, man. I just want you to understand. I've seen better days. My mind is in a haze of sorrow. Can't figure out what all this sadness is about. I don't even care if I ever, ever get anywhere. I don't want you to help me, no, no, no. I just want you here so I can say I've seen better days and my mind's in a haze of sorrow. So that was the first one. And then time went on, it was still there. <laughs> so the question became more of a, I don't know, a, just a ponderance. Uh, so many heartaches, so much pain, too many feelings to be feeling again. Hurtful toleration is the beginning of damnation. Bring me joy, bring me happiness, some tenderness, a warm caress. But all I am blessed with is my destiny. Too much to hope for, too much to try. Little pieces of laughter to make up for all the cry. Underlying tension is a soulful blue dimension. Bring me joy, bring me peace of mind. Please help me find this kind of bliss, the one that is missing in my song. And then I got old enough to try to have relationships. <laughs> and uh, I would say there was a bit of transference going on <laughs> when, when things were going wrong. Um, but I was always a very polite person that really thought about my words before I spat them out and hurt people with words. So I would always hurt, like something if the relationship didn't work out, I would hurt. But there were the songs. <laughs> and that's where I could put my anger. So pardon me for this piece of this song, but I was mad at a guy that had done me wrong. <laughs> You said yes to the devil and you live a life of sin. I should have known by all the trouble you're in. Yes to the devil, you burned your bridges down. Don't look my way when you need someone real around. When you said yes to the devil, you said goodbye to me. May God show you mercy. I was mad. <laughs> I have a lot of songs like that. <laughs> and then uh, as time went on, right before I was saved, my songs started changing quite a bit. And I was begging to be saved. And that was God working at me, on me, through the music. So I'll try to remember this song here. It's called Rescue Me, and I'll end with that. Please. Give me a ray of starlight 
for no one else to see. Shine it on me, please. Give me a perfect red rose that grows out of impossibility. Put it in my hand. Hey, can you rescue me from myself and the world? If so, then let's go there. Give me my light. Put it in my hands and rescue me. Yeah. Please turn love into an object I can see, touch, feel, and understand. Put it in my hands, please. Turn hurt into a single sheet of paper I can crumple up, tear to shreds, burn to ashes, and sweep away. Hey, can you rescue me from myself and the world? If so, then let's go there. Give me my light. Put it in my hands and rescue me. Let's go there. 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 Guess who's not going to sing for you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so um, my story today is called Seeing, and this actually goes back to my college days. So um, I moved to Chicago to study linguistics, uh, you know, language and culture, and I was interested in community development. And I grew up on a farm, so everything was kind of monocultural and monolinguistic. So coming to Chicago was an amazing opportunity for a little farm boy. I got to see people from all different backgrounds, I got to experience different cultures, I got to hear different languages, and it was a really exciting time for me. I loved my classes. I loved learning about how language and culture uh, really helps us to build communities, and strong communities with strong social organizations. So when I had the opportunity to do an internship, I took it, and it was an internship that was going to be in Kunming, China. And Kunming, China was this very large city about the size of Chicago at the time, and it was ultra diverse. And they used the term ultra diverse because it was kind of the connecting point to hundreds of different languages and hundreds of different people groups around the area. And this was kind of that point of access to the rest of the, to the, rest of the broader society in China. Um, the whole point of this trip was to learn, right? I wanted to learn about language, I wanted to learn about culture, and I was supposed to be learning how to use those things in community development. And of course, if I could be a little useful, that was just an added bonus. So I got to spend some time going to some small villages to see bilingual programs being built. I got to go see some public, uh, some public health initiatives that were campaigning, that were campaigning through, um, through increasing literacy rates and, and using that to develop a better, uh, better public health system. I even got to see some really great opportunities with organizations that worked with people who are deaf that were um, doing, uh, that were artists and, and finding ways for them to share their art broadly and widely within society. It was an amazing opportunity. And towards the end of this trip, I had, the, I had another opportunity to go to a very small village with some doctors. I was going to be no, not useful at all on this trip, right? I'm, I'm, I wasn't a doctor, I can't do anything, but I thought, why not, right? I'm here, I'm here to learn, so I'll go. The interesting thing about this trip, though, is that these doctors were going to set up a wound care clinic. And the wound care clinic was very important in this particular village because it was a leprosy colony, a leper colony. 
So people in this village had been kind of ostracized for generations from broader society and were not able to really access any of the, any of the adjacent towns. It was kind of the only place that they could go and it was kind of policed that way. People couldn't leave, they couldn't come, they couldn't go. Um, so we were going because we were with this medical team who was providing this, this wound care and we like take the bus, we go up the mountain, taking all the Dramamine pills that we can because the mountains in China and going up and down the hills was, was pretty hard on our stomachs. And then we, t we make this turn though, and we start and we look into this valley. And this valley is just absolutely beautiful. It's this beautiful green latticed of, it, lattices of rice fields going all the way down into the valley. And as you look and you can see uh, the, the entire valley in front of you, it's like brilliantly green, like glowing green. And you see people working in their rice paddies. And you see, um, you see water buffalo walking around as well. And, and we slowly descend into the valley and end up at this village. Now, the second I got at this village, I was like, what am I doing on this trip? I should have been back at one of the organizations that like, I was actually helpful in. I should go back with one of the organizations that I was actually learning something related to kind of language and culture because one thing they forgot to tell us was there were no translators. Uh, there's like two translators that were able to translate between uh, Mandarin Chinese and the local language, and they were working with the medical team. So here I am doing the whole foreigner thing, waving, and people showing us around place by place in the village, and, and I st slowly started to realize that we were in the way. And then the kids came out, and of course we started playing, you know, soccer with the kids, something that's kind of somewhat universal, like you give kids a ball and they'll figure out what to do with it. So, you know, we were playing some sports. Well, and then I realized we were also in the way there. These kids were supposed to be doing their chores. They weren't supposed to be entertaining the foreigners, they were supposed to be doing chores. So I'm slowly realizing that I feel completely useless and I feel like I'm not really able to learn what I was supposed to be learning on this trip anyway. So we finally get invited to sit down with a group of elders and I wasn't sure if this was like a situation where they were honoring us because we're drinking tea with the elders or if this was a situation where they're like, okay, we're going to move you out of the way and put you into, <laughs> into this nice little, nice little room with some of the elders at the table. Now again, we don't speak the same language, so there's a lot of me leaning over to my friends and smiling and nodding and laughing and them leaning over, talking, laughing, and we all just sat and nodded and laughed, looked look across the table and smile and nod and laugh, showed pictures from my family so that they could see my family and we smile and nodded and laughed. They came over and touched the blonde hair from my blonde my, my blonde colleagues and they touched the, the dark skin from my black colleagues and they smiled and nodded and laughed and we all just did a lot of that for a long time. As I'm looking outside the window, I see everyone else being useful. I see kids doing their chores. I see other people carrying stuff in from the fields. I see the doctors cleaning the wounds. The way that leprosy works is it kills your, it, it kind of kills the nerves so you don't know if you get a cut. Right? If you get a cut and then it gets infected, you don't really feel it. It doesn't hurt. So it, was, it, was, um, it, it gets infected and then eventually you get ulcers and people kind of all over the village were losing fingers, hands, feet, and most of the people there were still working in the fields. So here we are with these elders, many of them having a hard time getting around, and we're all just smiling and nodding, and I'm realizing I'm completely useless. So the dinner comes to an end. All right? the tea time, tea time comes to an end, and we decide to walk back up to leave, and I'm kind of like a little bit relieved because I'm like, okay, what's next? I can actually, you know, go to another project where I can learn something that's related to community development. I can go somewhere and I can actually maybe be useful from the stuff that I studied. Um, but as we're walking up, I slowly start to realize that all these elders are walking up the mountain with us. And it's a very unstable road. And many of them are missing, you know, missing feet or their feet are, you know, clubbed and, and kind of turning inwards and, and they're using canes and having a hard time getting up there. And every now and then they're like grabbing our shoulders to kind of stabilize themselves and they start talking to us and we look over and we smile and we nod and laugh. And then we get all the way back up to the, to this, um, we, we get back into the mountain into our van that's going to take us, take us away. 
And um, we finally reconnected with the one or two translators that were actually there. And we, have, we formally say our goodbyes and our thank yous, as you do when you politely visit somebody else's, somebody else's home. And I will never forget what this one lady said to me. This one lady says, she, she looks at me, she kind of grabs me by the arm, and she says, thank you. She had been the one that was grabbing my arm the whole time, so we had built a connection based on smiling and nodding. And she, she grabs my arm and she says, thank you. Thank you for seeing us. And it was in that moment I think I learned more than anything else on that trip. And I learned more probably than I did in college. So much of the human experience that we have today is built around what can we do, what can we fix, how can we improve something, what development can we do in the community, how do we be useful, even in our call to worship, we talked about activism, right? How do we be active? But so much of the human experience is built around seeing, seeing our neighbors, seeing the people sitting in the pew next to us, seeing the people in the bus stop, seeing the people in our own homes. In that moment, I realized that so much of what I was doing on this trip was about me and about learning and about doing so that I could feel useful. And I had to switch, switch that. I had to realize that so much of the human experience is just about seeing the other person. That's what makes us human, is seeing each other. Songs and stories. Was that powerful? Let's take a moment just to breathe. 
Hmm. Let us see one another. Sometimes what we see is not fun, but it's important to see one another on this journey. And I'm so glad for the invitation to sing as participation, to sing as a space of allowing our pain to come forward. The church has not always been good with allowing pain to come forward. And sometimes the truth of the matter is we are in pain when we arrive to church and in our lives, sitting with pain, facing our fears. Stories are powerful, and we want to thank Joe and Jade and Paul and Valerie for their stories. You all have stories too, and those stories are powerful as well. May we hear each other's stories. In the summer, we'll try to do this again. So if you have a story and you're like, I want to share it, we'll include you in the summer. But our stories are powerful. Amen. <laughs>